Welcome to the Reimagine Podcast. Each week, we'll explore InsureTech innovation from our incubator based in Hartford, Connecticut. From startups to scale ups, innovators to entrepreneurs, we'll bring you conversations with people making it happen in Hartford. Hi, this is Paul Tyler with another episode of the Reimagine Podcast. And uh, Kate, glad to see you again today. Hi, hello from Hartford. <laughs> nice from to Hartford. see you as well. Hi, Kate. Kate, it's the same <laughs> guest. It's funny, we've, we've had an interesting uh, ride for a few weeks, not only meeting some really interesting people, but also knowing more about how we all live together. And <laughs> That's right. House. And That's listen, right. we have some, some real special yeah. guests. So, Kate, do you want to set the discussion up? or? Uh, oh, or gosh, yeah. <laughs> Well, we have a, a, a couple of folks from Force Di- Diagnostics, and I am very excited to hear all about. I think it's super relevant that we're talking about uh, talking to you today. So, welcome. So, Paul likes to do this. So, my first time. Bear with me. <laughs> we always ask the couple of questions: Who are you, and what problem are you looking to solve? Sure. So, I'm Scott Filer. I'm CEO of Force Diagnostics. And I'm with Kim Anderson, our our executive vice president for insurance services and business dev. You know, uh, my background is not in the insurance space. In fact, I fell by accident into this. I've been in the healthcare industry in basically market strategy, primarily in the ambulatory or outpatient care marketplace for the last 15, 20 years. And I was conducting some consulting on behalf of this company. Force Diagnostics. They were looking to expand their offering in the wellness space. And now now I, I use words like face value and take and rate instead of the, the clinical the cl- clinical uh, phrases and, and uh, <laughs> lexicon. Now I'm using life insurance parlance far more frequently. And yeah, get ready for the acronyms. Yourself. Lots of acronyms. Lots, Lots of, of acronyms. acronyms. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, so I, and obviously, listen, no, one other addition is you're also our latest addition to our family of programs in our uh, start reimagined. So I want to welcome, welcome you, Scott. And Scott, you are in Chicago, correct? Is that we're outside of Chicago? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Kim, tell us your, you know, what, what are you doing in the company? And, uh, you know, tell us about, you know, how you all sort of came together as a team. How we came together. I think I'm one of the people that dragged Scott kicking and screaming into the insurance industry, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I've got 30 plus years experience. I might be showing my age a little bit there, but really started in, in the field gathering medical information for life insurance underwriting. That I ended up selling. I had a successful exit with a, a regional paramedical company and take, took a corporate position with a Dallas based organization at that point. It was there for a lot of years in the role of senior vice president and really did everything related to supporting medical underwriting for, for insurance. So, everything from dropping apps to gathering information to issuing decisions. I took an exit from that organization and have been consulting for the last four years. Force brought me in a couple of years ago to really help round out the, the product offering. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get into a lot of discussion about what we were doing. We had some really interesting offerings with, with diagnostics. And then we really rounded that out by providing a whole suite of medical underwriting resources, if you will. And that happened about a year and a half ago. And so Scott and I have been been out trying to get some money ever since. <laughs> okay. Now, now the, the problem that just sort of, you know, I, I know you do a lot. I know you do a lot yeah. of some, some diagnostic doctors. The one that really sort of caught my attention was, you know, actually doing that pyramid exam, right? So let's, let's kind of rewind the clock, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so... One of my primary areas of responsibility in my past life was was herding cats. I had over five thousand mobile pyramid examiners that ran around wow. the country. You know, get, yeah, it was a lot of people, and so I'm pretty intimately familiar with what the challenges were with with that whole process: quality, time, customer satisfaction. Wait, but, but, yeah. but how bad was it? Listen, I, I get a life insurance. Kate sold me this life insurance policy. Okay. Yeah. Great. Oh, it, okay. it, okay. it can be a challenge. You know, typically yeah. if you want life insurance, and a lot of people need life insurance right now, you place your application and your agent does something with that application. And then you sit around and you wait for your right. phone to ring. Usually it's a mobile paramed who's calling you. And uh, these are gig workers. 
not specifically trained necessarily all the same way. They'll call you, they'll schedule an appointment at some point in the future at your home or office, come out and do some paperwork, at some point process it and send it back. There was a a potential for a lot of reschedules, missing information, maybe grabbing the wrong form kind of thing. And so a lot of rework. That whole process could take, you know, on average from two weeks to, you know, up to a month or more. So what we wanted to set out to do was provide a tool to the life insurance industry and consumers that allows them to fulfill any obligations literally the same day. So we we take a process that can take weeks and we shrink it down to a day or two tops. Right. And, and by the way, Paul, Paul, to interrupt real quick, you know, the, the, the name force diagnostics is a little bit of a, of a misnomer, I think, because it stems from our past where our principal business plan was to provide rapid diagnostics in the form of point of care tests, like a finger stick at retail pharmacies in order to affect getting underwriting completed, right? And, and, and to replace a fluid test. Really, it was the life insurance industry itself that pushed back and said, you know, actually, we, we want fluids. A number of our reinsurance advisors have all pretty much stipulated that they don't think fluids are going to go away. And that led to pivoting from the retail pharmacy marketplace to the care on demand marketplace, which is a multi-billion dollar pre-built infrastructure of clinical care that's growing and spread throughout the United States taking a quick step back to, to Kim's point. So we're not a diagnostics company. We're, we're an underwriting data services company. And it, it really has its, its origins from the recognition that not just the paramedical model has challenges, and it truly, truly does. But really, from the standpoint of the life insurance company, long sales cycles lose applicants. Mm-hmm. They know it. The industry knows it, right? Each applicant interaction increases the chance of attrition. So every time they touch that applicant, there's a chance they're going to lose that sale. And the single most critical space or the biggest pain point where that that attrition can occur is on the collection of the medical information. That's where the greatest amount of, of attrition occurs. But it's also, interestingly, one of the major places of fraud. Um, RGA had a great had a great conference. It's unfortunately now it's two years ago. It'll be three this coming August where they basically positioned out where the greatest amount of fraud that financially impacts the life insurance industry. And of the 10 different spaces of potential fraud, we actually address three of them. And they're also the three largest. Yeah. In a significant way. Yeah. (laughs) So So our, our process and our software, it's a, it's a, it's a proprietary web app. It connects life insurance applicants with an exclusive neighborhood network of urgent care clinics, and that's growing nationwide. We're in negotiations with the second and third largest health systems in the country. It accelerates the underwriting process from, as Kim just said a few moments ago, you know, that that several week wait to, I mean, this isn't the same for all carriers, but you can imagine it's not uncommon for someone to wait about 45 days. We can get applicants to in good order within 48 hours. So we accelerate the underwriting, which at least should increase the take-in rate of these policies because you're going from sales distribution to immediate issuance as opposed to waiting a month. And then we reduce, obviously our system reduces the the steps in the middle. Mm-hmm. And, and we're, we're far more, more than just a replacement for pyramids. Kim, or, I'll let Paul answer any questions, but I, or yeah. ask you. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm just curious though. It's, I mean, not to give any sort of special sauce away or any, you know, special, you know, behind, two behind the curtain, but, you know, you're, you're basically saying, okay, we're going to make things a lot easier for you. It's going to be a lot quicker. We're going to reduce your fraud. How? <laughs> Is yeah. there anything that you can reveal that helps, you know, yeah. uh, go back the curtain just a, just a little tiny bit? Yeah, oh, no, okay. no. I'm happy to, to share that level of the secret sauce. It's a relevant question. So the, the mobile paramed, let's sort of jump to the today picture. That mobile paramed is working out of a banker's box in the back of their car. 
They have a bunch of different forms in there. They've got paper tickets sometimes, work tickets, a variety of different diagnostic kits. And it's real easy for them to make a mistake, grab the wrong form, not answer it accurately, what have you. So the first thing our system does is it's completely 100% paperless. We don't touch documents. We create data and we use that data to then create a document if that's what you need. The second thing that we do is we we don't send anything snail mail. We will accommodate an existing reference lab. So if you still want us to throw something in the mail, the CRL or exam one, we do that for you. But the rapid diagnostics also give us some, some ability to test instantly and send those results instantly. And then I would say the last thing, which is really huge from a consumer perspective, is the minute we get the order in our system, We'll take it anyway. You can call us, you can key it, you can B2B, whatever. We'll accommodate every workflow. But the minute we get the order, you as the consumer get a, a text, a custom link via text and email where you can click that and schedule your appointment anywhere at any facility in the country. And you can reschedule it. You can walk in. So literally, if you have an urgent care facility that's in your neighborhood, and most people do, it's just a matter of going, boom, I'm on my way. And then you walk around the corner, you walk in, and the technicians sure a guide through the entire process. Yeah, um, I, fourth, I, I, yeah four, fourth item, and I got to lay this one out. No, please. Yeah, the, the last item is once that exam is completed, there's usually processing that has to take place and mailing or something. Our system sort of scrubs and validates the data as it's being entered. So the minute that technician pushes done, boom, off to the cloud and onto the underwriter's desk it goes. So there is no wait time for processing. You get the package in good order on the first pass. Yeah, I, I, you know, and I, I can kind of, you know, speak for for the problems just from a, a number of sides. One is customer, you know, having purchased a number of life insurance policies, you know, yeah, you're right. Schedule if somebody doesn't show up, they show up late. Mm -hmm. You look at this person; they're about to, you know, take blood out with your with this needle. You're like, does this person really know what they're doing? Yeah. <laughs> I kind of feel like that, where you think, I'm, I'm not so sure this is the person I want poking my arm with this. Yeah, um, you know some of very, and I want to say some have been exceptionally professional, right? But it's still very intrusive to come to my house. I have to leave them. I have to go, you know, into another room. To, you know, do stuff where I'm leaving mm -hmm. somebody in my house. I don't know, like, yeah, not the way you design this if you do this from scratch, right? Um, now the flip side, Scott, you mentioned the fraud. Yeah, working at another carrier in a couple of different, you know, life insurance facets, one was clients as well. Yeah, fraud, Kim, huge. Right. I mean, we had it's gi it's gigantic. So, I mean, the, look, here here's the financial relationship today. And this will maybe help kind of sum up a big picture for people. First of all, I'm a big fan of mobile paramedics. I've had a lot of them on my team. I love them. They're hardworking people. So I got nothing bad to say about a mobile paramed. I will say, however, that they're typically, like I mentioned, gig worker employees. And a lot of people are really shocked to hear that from state to state, most states have no regulation regarding phlebotomy. So everybody here on this webcast and listening can go take, you know, a do-it-yourself course online and call yourself a phlebotomist. So that's a little scary. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little scary. And there really isn't any regular clinical like CLIA certifications that we have to have in the paramed business that you do have to have in the healthcare business. So the, the level of technician and medical service that a proposed insured gets with our process is a way different level. I mean, these people are trained, certified, monitored, continuing education, directly supervised, you know, corrective action for mistakes. You just go on and on and on about the, the level of services, much different experience. From the fraud perspective there, Paul, too. We should make sure that we we preface that that like Kim just said we we don't besmirch the the paramedical industry at all. In fact, believe it or not, our system can certainly integrate <laughs> paramedical services. Mobile paramed availability um, is an option. Absolutely, you know <laughs> yeah. our system our system looks like open table. It just shows you where the availability is for you to have your your services your clinical data capture done. Right, but you know there is an inherent collusion issue that can happen. And by the way, I'm also not besmirching the captive agent marketplace where these people are selling policies. But, you know, it, it when you have a relationship with a paramed 
there's concerns that that perhaps that paramed just lets pass, you know, a blood pressure. Yeah, it's pretty much 120 over 70. I'll tell you in, in my own personal experiences, just strictly my experience. I've experimented with paramed's <laughs> in comparative shopping um, to on my own because we were standing up the company and I wanted to know what they did. And I had a paramed come to my home. She didn't come the first time, so she she did not arrive the day she was supposed to. And I was told that I was incorrect on the day yeah, and time that she was supposed to come. Yeah, um, she came the next day. I am hypertensive. I have diastolic hypertension. I'm on metropolol. Everybody, you are now allowed to know that. I'm not worried about that hip information. Um, <laughs> hip has so been waved. Yeah, we'll sign the waiver later. Anyway, she took my blood pressure. And she said, oh, yeah. one." I said, what is it? She goes, 170 or 120 over 70. And I said, really? And she goes, yep. And I said, you sure? And she goes, I took it twice. Now, as a person with a clinical background, she took it once. And she wrote down 120 over 70 both times on my document. Now, the incentives, nothing against any of these people, but their incentives are a little bit, a little bit skewed. They're trying to close sales. Totally makes sense. I get it. I, I, again, I don't besmirch them for it. But when you're looking at the, the care on demand marketplace, so urgent cares themselves, that is a, like I highlighted very early on, that is a multi-billion dollar infrastructure. Their bread and butter is clinical care. They will not risk their medical licensure to fudge a blood pressure. Right. And and those really, it, it's just good, good business practice. It's good due diligence for a person that is incentivized to sell, to have an arm's length relationship right. or, or greater than with the people who are helping qualify your sale. It's just, think, it just makes practical sense. I think the, po- sense, the right? point Scott's trying to make here too is that paramed examiners are paid on a per ticket basis. Right. So their incentive is to keep the agent happy, get the exam done as quick as possible, ask the least amount of questions possible, and get that that ticket done. Oh, per yeah. So and, and again, my, 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 yeah, 99% I think are great. It's like that 1% you yeah. get. So, I mean, we, we dealt with issues like you can't make this stuff up only as business body doubles. Mm-hmm. So Scott, they weren't even showing up to, to take your blood pressure. They were taking their the same person multiple times. Oh, yep. <laughs> you know, we, we uh, I I've seen the gamut, right? Because you know, again, yeah. Listen, anytime you have incentives and you got everybody lined up for work, but you have something better now. And, and Scott, now I want to sort of pull the thread you mentioned, which is speed insurance. Mm-hmm. You, you've been in this business for a long time. Insurance is really tough business to get your head around, and yeah. if you start to look. Close enough at this business, piece by piece by piece, everything looks like an expense that can be cut unless you sort of see it in the totality. And Scott, the point you made, maybe we could spend a few minutes talking about length of shortening sales funnel and increasing close rates, right? Like if, if I look at the profitability of a, a life, you know, uh, new business operation, that placement rate is a mammoth impact on the profitability of your new business. So maybe just spend some time there because... A lot of people don't understand and connect the dots there with time placement rates and what that actually means for your ROI and your, your life business. I'll set him up, Kim, and then you knock him down. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so Paul, that, that's a fabulous question. In fact, it's come up a number of times. So we have, a, well, we're blessed that we have a grouping of actuarial advisors for the company. And in fact, we have a model that we're more than happy to share with investors and also life insurance carriers who are interested in sort of figuring this out, noodling what it looks like. To your point, one or two basis points more to or, or increase in taken rate is millions and millions of dollars. It is quite mammoth. You are correct. That is the right analogy. Of course, getting to taken rate is a challenge because that's a part of the secret sauce of every single carrier. They don't necessarily divulge. Um, mm-hmm. That's why we're hoping, you know, uh, uh, reimagine is going to help us get access to some good Limra data, but that, <laughs> that, that, that to the side. Yeah, though, no, that's a critical component to selling and qualifying that what we're doing actually matters. Cause if it, if it didn't matter that someone was in good order within 48 hours, as opposed to 48 days, Maybe maybe this the sales issue isn't as big a deal. We have yet 
to encounter a life carrier who we've presented our solution to, have them kick us out the door. So every time we tell them that we can get them within 48 hours to basically two to three days to get them in good order, they sit down and they go, all right, talk to us about it. So anyway, Kim, take it, take to take it to the next page. Yeah, I mean, I, he hammered it home. I mean, every every carrier takes a look at our value proposition, and while they all measure success in a different way, I think the the foundational core of what we're offering, which is you know a better product, a faster product, consumer self service tools, you know, those all in general are going to lead to better placement rates and are are going to improve your top and your bottom line. An interesting metric is, you know, we hear a lot that folks don't want to go anywhere. You know, they want to have exams done in their house. It, interestingly enough, some of the metrics we, we've seen support that consumers do want to go somewhere. And in fact, the taken rates are as high as, you know, 80, 85 percent when they're walking into a, a medical facility with trained people, as opposed to as low as maybe 45 percent with the traditional process. Yeah, so there's a big delta there. Honestly, we we've got uh, two carriers that have agreed to help us. One with a blind study, blind test study in San Francisco, and another that is looking to do a proof of concept in New York. Both markets we're live in, and we're we're hoping to prove that that theory uh, with those two pilots. But absolutely, it's going to be hugely impactful to the the bottom line of the insurance companies, no doubt. But interestingly, just as a a pivot from the insurance carriers, one of the questions we get as a startup is the level to which, how hard is it getting urgent cares to sign on? And that actually is the easiest component of, of what we do. But besides that, right now, because of the COVID-19 event, urgent cares and the ambulatory care marketplace is much more keen to be looking at, hey, when the dam finally breaks and we can get back to to business normal, we would like to have a a large influx of simple non-pathology driven customer visits, which which it's just, they get paid for the turn of the wheel in in a business sense, right? Because they're acting as vendors. So there's been a sudden spike from our perspective in being approached by the clinical spaces trying to get our customers from the life insurance companies. Does that make sense? Yeah. And of course, the the word on the street, and you would know better than us, Paul, perhaps, but the word on the street is actually life products are selling at a pretty high high pace right now. I, Electronic I think takes, life products. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think yeah. it takes a, a fear of, of, uh, of a morbidity or mortality associated with a pandemic disease to get people interested in having their lives properly protected. Financially speaking. Yeah, financially speaking. Puts it all in perspective. Yeah. So when when it comes to just, uh, you know, switching gears just a little bit, when it comes to, you know, pre, post-COVID, you know, all the environment aside, you know, there's been so much disruption in this space. I mean, can you talk a little bit about what you've seen out there? You know, do you feel that the innovation is at a pace that it needs to be? Is it going too fast for carriers to kind of adopt, too slow? How are you feeling in this environment? Oh, I'm going to take this one, Scott. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, there's a subset of of carriers that I think are hugely innovative, you know, very much keeping their finger on the pulse of insure tech. You've even seen some more of the traditional life carriers spin off other brands and and start to stand up um, like online web ordering portals and whatnot. I think those carriers that have adopted some of those technologies are the ones that are benefiting from a spike or an increase in, in life apps. I think we're also seeing a whole lot of activity where automated underwriting systems are concerned and all of the reinsurers have, you know, very compelling offerings at this point. Mm -hmm. And it does seem like most of the insurance companies are exploring those. Now, the antithesis of that is we have heard from a couple of carriers that there's so many shiny objects out there, like, you know, what do we focus on? And so some of them are struggling from a capacity perspective. Integration is time consuming, expensive, you know, which items do we pick to work on? Frankly, I think that's a sweet spot for us. 
our health information system is very robust. So we can gather, store, and push data out in massive capacity. So we're able to be that conduit. One of the concepts we didn't talk about a whole lot was this notion of precision underwriting, which I'll touch on a little bit. Because in, instead of bringing in a life app and then building a list of things that you need to gather to make a decision, we kind of flip that. We go, we take your consumer and we do a core baseline of information, take the inputs and then use that to drive other services, right? So, so that notion combined with our data partners provides a one-stop shop, if you will, to the insurance carriers. So it, it's been interesting. I think they, they like the idea of integrating with one entity, but getting this full suite of data in that one project, I guess. Yeah, interesting. I think I think it's going to be a kind of a mixed mixed bag. I think there's enormous opportunity. You know, I think the people who are probably on the front lines making decisions are just, you know, feel just submerged with issues for day to day business. And Scott, as you said, you're absolutely right. Demand is at all time high, but you know, if you don't have homeowners insurance, it's probably not the best time to buy home insurance when you see the the hurricane coming through, you know, about to hit hit the shore. Yeah. So, you know, I'm I'm sure you're totally dialed into this. I mean, every state has imposed different restrictions around lapsation of life insurance policy. So, you know, all the operational areas are scrambling to figure out how do we comply with like 50 different rules that are in place, right? That's number one. Number two is the risk, right? Guess what? Seeing your life insurance demand is through the roof. Now, a lot of the carriers though, have had to literally chop off, you know, certain older age limits. Um, we've had to, some of them have delayed processing intentionally. So, Scott, to your point, let's slow down the placement rates till we know what we have in the pipeline, uh, which is a little antithetical to to uh, you know building a, a robust business. And then I think in some of the younger ages, you know, fear is just you know. I'm, what do we have? 25 million people unemployed. You know, even if you want it, can you afford it? You know, are you going to lapse it? I think once we get back to business, though, you're going to be in the high demand. Like, I'm thinking, you know, Scott for some of our early exchanges. You know, well, hey, listen, I could you could go have an underwriter come into your house, or you could go someplace else that's nice and clean. Okay, before you know February, before February, that was a, a really interesting customer value proposition. I think today. You know, tomorrow it's going to be table stakes to be staying in a life insurance business. I mean, do you disagree with me? I'll take that as a yes. You, you do not. Disagree. <laughs> so, so Kate, normally no, no. you'd ask about Hartford. How are you going to ask about Hartford now? Well, okay. First, have you been? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, let's say tomorrow. You know, we are vaccine, we're all ready to all collaborate together. Like what, what is your expectation and, and, you know, touching down in Hartford, you know, joining uh, the reimagined program, having this new innovative ecosystem kind of at your fingertips. What are your expectations then? Yeah, that's, that's a cool question that I wasn't expecting, but I, but um, <laughs> no, no, but we're, we're really blessed again. Yeah. So many blessings. We're very blessed because our, our principal, urgent care partner actually has clinics in Hartford. So it's pretty easy for us to execute on a proof of concept in Hartford. But, you know, one of the things we didn't even talk about, so the founders who founded our company, uh, or the investors rather, also founded in, in Telescript, which was acquired by by Milliman in 2008. And so we're kind of like stepchildren together. We, we, we talk with Milliman a lot, so it's a good example. But one of the things that we talk about is, you know, because we're a data services company, how do we in the workflow integrate big data so that we actually can affect what, what Kim was talking about, that precision underwriting goal, right? So one of the exciting things about Reimagine and the incubator is having access to actually the data players who are just now beginning to design how they're going to implement or or integrate their systems into what they don't quite realize it yet, but our type of workflow uh, vis-a-vis where we can take retail and clinical data that's either risk scored or otherwise provides us with an algorithm to determine 
which tests are most appropriate for the given individual in that precision underwriting example. So you're me, you, you told them on your application online that you do not have a history of heart disease and yet you're hypertensive. And by the way, your retail pharmacy data stream will show, or mine will, that I'm on metropolo, right? Well, ordinarily, that would stimulate an APS or an attending physician statement, right? And that's what would be executed on. Our system has the capacity to front end that and actually pivot a customer at the front end of that clinic from just having their their basic vitals, their height, their weight, their, their body mass index, their blood pressure, and pivots them actually to be seen by a clinician and we can preload the questions because this is all based on machine learning, right? So we can preload questions which would clarify how long I've been on metropolo, when was I diagnosed with hypertension, what is my typical blood pressure. Theoretically, we can eliminate a good proportion of APSs, which are another pain point in the industry that take a great deal of time. We've eliminated it right then. So yeah, we're excited with all the data folks. And by the way, any of the new life, we, we love these direct-to-consumer or electronic app companies, mm-hmm. partly because some of them have very simple jet issue or rapid issue products, and their, their underwriting engines cut off an entire book of business based just on their rules engine, right? right. Well, the beauty of, of our system is that we, we have we have a, a reinsurer and their associated insurance company. They do a rapid issue. And what they've asked us to consider in terms of a pilot is, look, we, we lose business on this huge proportion of that we cut out. Fallout. Um, right? <laughs> fallout. They, they're fallout they, these fallouts. And basically what's happening is the data stream is telling us they may be morbidly obese or smoke. If that's it, you could never really utilize a pyramid for something that simple but we can utilize an urgent care whereby we send that individual to the urgent care. We discover that whether they're obese or not, we have a BMI rating of say 27 when they're at the urgent care that would immediately indicate a need for a hemoglobin A1C test. And they may be able, this person may have a a BMI or, or they may actually not be what the data was saying and they will get that book of business. So, We've got a lot of these these early innovative direct to consumer or electronic. Um, I, I, what's that? Everyday life is that a good call out to one of one of the partners? They've got these great products that also are are looking at ways to integrate wellness as a means of adjusting for premium value or cost. Right. Mm-hmm. This model is perfect for that. In fact, the urgent cares are asking us, how do we get more involved on a day-to-day basis or quarter-to-quarter or year-to-year basis with these customers? So, no, uh, Reimagine is going to be a great resource because there's a lot smarter people than me that are hanging out there. I mean, look, it's got uh-huh. it's got Paul and Kate. I mean, that's yeah. already. Yeah. It's, You're right. Hey, listen, th- thanks so much for the time. You know, we can't wait to have you as part of your program. You're actually involved in our Solvathon you know, that we're, we're starting virtually this right. next week. And I'm excited to, you know, introduce you to our, our team and our, our, uh, our management team as well there. How do people find you if they want more questions? Or they want to uh, get a demo. Forcediagnostics.com. We're also on LinkedIn. And Scott and I, all of our contact information is published. And we welcome direct outreach and direct messaging from anybody. I promise a personal response. We'd love to hear from you. And we're also in crunch. We're also in crunch base. Yeah, crunch base. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. I don't know. Kate, Kate, any other questions for him before we... Uh, no, we're here? just super excited to, to see you in person and, um, and virtually at the Solvathon. Can't yeah, wait. Looks it. like it's yeah. going to be great. All right. Thank you hey, listen, excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kim. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Kate. And uh, tune again next week for another episode of the Reimagine Podcast. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find more information about our program at imagine.nsre.com.